Hello there. It's time for episode 148, our latest episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Today's episode is going to talk about President Theodore Roosevelt, who not only studied jujitsu and judo, he was actually instrumental in bringing Japanese grappling arts to prominence in the United States. Let me introduce myself. I'm Whistlekick's founder, but better known here as your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, if you're not familiar with our company, makes the best sparring gear you can get, as well as some fun apparel and accessories for practitioners and fans of the traditional martial arts. I want to welcome everybody that's come back, and I want to say thank you to those of you checking us out for the first time. I hope you have fun. Hope you learn something. All of our past episodes, including the show notes, photos, videos, links, all that other great stuff, is at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. No hyphens or anything. From that site, you can sign up for our newsletter, and I hope you do, because we offer exclusive content to subscribers, discounts, it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show, and we're not going to spam you. We send out, on average, two issues a month. Not too bad. Now, today's episode has a full transcript over on the website, and let's dig in. Before we talk about the grappling antics of our 26th president, I wanted to take a minute and share some feedback I received. It hit me pretty hard, and I wanted to respond to it a bit. This email came in a couple weeks ago. It starts, Hi, Jeremy. Thanks so much for the Whistlekick podcast. I think you may have changed my life today. I'm 40 and just started Krav Maga and Kung Fu in October. Yes, I know, I shouldn't do two at once, but I love both and couldn't decide on just one. Anyway, I just finished listening to episode 79, and after hearing your story, I had to stop and write. This is the first time I've emailed a stranger like this. I hope you don't mind. So I had a similar upbringing, picked on, abused, bordering on torture by other kids, both physical and mental, mostly for being black, female, and dark-skinned. Plus, being bigger than most girls, with glasses, and pretty smart, I never fit in anywhere. By high school, there were times when I was afraid to go to school, knowing that either I would be cornered or somehow humiliated. I remember one incident sitting in the back of the bus, and two of the more popular boys sat on either side of me. They got very quiet, and someone in front of me called my name. So I looked up. Everyone was looking back at me, and the two boys punched me, hard, on either side of the face at the same time. I was so ashamed, and can't really think of another time where I felt so stupid, so ashamed, and couldn't do anything about it. Had I had something like martial arts, I highly doubt I would have ended up there that day. Even now, reading that, I want to throw up. I feel silly about it, but there you go. After that, my confidence and self-esteem was so low, I ended up in an abusive relationship, still in high school, with one of those boys. I wanted to be accepted so much, I was willing to be a victim to have some connection with someone. God, even now the thought of how I allowed myself to be treated makes me ill. What's even sadder is that I still recognize that young girl in me, even now. Fast forward to today, and I'm outwardly confident. I have a good job. My kids are amazing, and I'm generally happy. But every day, I see myself in the mirror and wonder where the next punch is coming from. Not really physically, but you know what I mean. Every time I see someone whisper, I wonder if it's about me. I jump when people speak too loudly, too. I guess I also have put myself in the situation to still be treated, while not badly, definitely not demanding the kind of relationship I deserve. So, I decided to take matters into my own hands lately with martial arts. I wish I would have done it when I was younger, but at least I'm here now. Okay, wow. That was tougher than I thought. So, the point. Thank you for your podcast. I think hearing about all these folks who have been through these things really helped me feel like I'm not alone anymore. I am sure you're spammed with these kind of emails all the time, and I definitely appreciate you taking the time to read this. I just wanted to reach out and thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks, and Merry Christmas, Vanessa. I've already written to Vanessa privately, but I want to thank her publicly for her email. She's clearly taken a huge step forward. She's proof that it's never too late to face your fears and make your life better. I had to stop the recording for a moment because even though that's the third time I've read that email, it still got me choked up. If you, well, I doubt any of you out there have the kind of memory for what happens on what episodes that I do, uh, being that I'm the one that records them. But on episode 79, I got kind of personal. It was an episode that I was nervous about doing and really just kind of laid it all out there in the same way that Vanessa did. And it is the episode that has received the most feedback. And even though I don't share it all, and even though not all of it is as deep and as um, significant to the people 
that have written in, I know it's had an impact and it's the episode that I'm probably proudest of. And in part because I have a hard time putting myself out there so openly. And part of the show is me learning to do that. I appreciate all the feedback I receive and I do try to write back to everybody that writes in for whatever reason. Just today I responded to someone's question about stretching challenges that they're having. I mean, I'm certainly not the best person to go to for that advice, I think, on the internet, but I will happily help wherever I can for as long as I can. The way the show is growing, there may be a time where I can't do that, but I'll do it for as long as possible. Let's talk about Teddy Roosevelt now. I was listening to a podcast the other day when I heard one of the hosts make an offhanded reference to President Teddy Roosevelt having practiced judo. It wasn't a martial arts podcast, but the idea struck me and I went and did some research. Not only did President Roosevelt practice judo, but there's quite a story here. President Roosevelt was a fighter. If he were alive today, he'd probably be ringside at MMA events. It wouldn't surprise me if he'd have shown up at a professional wrestling event in the ring. Not only did this man love competition, he really loved combat, all forms of it. He was a practiced wrestler and a boxer. He did things his way, and he enjoyed a challenge. As a kid, boxing was self-defense for him. Asthmatic, weak, frequently picked on, young Theodore had a lot of bullies. Here's a quote from his autobiography. Having been a sickly boy with no natural bodily prowess and having lived much at home, I was at first quite unable to hold my own when thrown into contact with other boys of rougher antecedents. I was nervous and timid. At 14, he asked his father if he could learn boxing, and his father said yes. Another quote. I was a painfully slow and awkward pupil, and certainly worked two or three years before I made any perceptible improvement, whatever. During later schooling at Harvard, he competed in boxing, but also now wrestling. He wasn't on any college teams, but still an active competitor. In fact, he developed a small following around Boston because of the heart he brought to competition. He certainly wasn't the best, but he just wouldn't quit. In 1899, Roosevelt became governor of New York and preferred grappling as his athletic pursuit. The American middleweight wrestling champion was near his home in Albany, so he hired him. Three to four times a week, Roosevelt trained with a wrestler. Quote, Roosevelt, who was in his early 40s at the time, nearly double the age of the wrestler, looked forward to his training sessions so much that he eventually bought a wrestling mat for the workout room. John Finkel wrote in Teddy Roosevelt, the U.S. president that was always tough and ready to throw down for the post game. As an aside, what a wonderful title for a book. Quote, while neither combatant had a problem with the wrestling mat, Roosevelt's comptroller did, and he refused to audit the bill for the mat, claiming that wrestling wasn't, quote, proper gubernatorial amusement. Now, what did the comptroller suggest as a better pursuit? A pool table. <laughs> that never happened. Once he became president, he set up quite a few mats in the White House basement and sparred with anyone that would spend the time, including his wife and sister-in-law. In fact, he'd spar with nearly anyone of any discipline. If they were willing to go hard and he thought it was worthwhile, he'd do it. It was part of his desire to keep his skills up and his weight down. If you've seen photos of President Roosevelt towards the end of his life, you know that the skill piece was much more successful than the weight piece. He learned judo from one of Jigoro Kano, the founder of judo's students, Yoshiaki Yamashita. Yamashita wasn't just any old judoka, though. He was the 19th student of the school and considered one of Kano's four top students. He originally learned of judo, uh, that's President Roosevelt, when a wrestling instructor of his showed him some movements that he'd learned during time in Japan. Yamashita taught him three to four afternoons a week for several months. The president once said in 1905, the art of jiu-jitsu is worth more in every way than all of our athletics combined. From research, it appears that Roosevelt confused judo and jiu-jitsu or else didn't know the difference somehow. There are writings of his where he referred to his judo teacher, Yamashita, as having taught him jiu-jitsu. Quote, the president's training partners included his sons, his private secretary, the Japanese naval attache, Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, and Secretary of the Interior, Gifford Pinchot. When these people were unavailable, then Roosevelt tried tricks on husky young visitors. Joseph R. Svinth wrote in an article titled, Professor Yamashita Goes to Washington. Robert Johnstone Mooney, who had been one of the visitors that President Roosevelt threw around, later wrote, quote, he sprang to his feet and excitedly asked, by the way, do you boys understand jujitsu? 
We replied in the negative, and he continued, pounding the air with his arms. You must promise me to learn that without delay. You are so good in other athletics that you must add jiu-jitsu to your other accomplishments. Every American athlete ought to understand the Japanese system thoroughly. You know, and he smiled reminiscently, I practically introduced it to the Americans. I had a young Japanese, now at Harvard, who was named Kitagaki, here for six months, and I tried jiu-jitsu with him day after day, but he always defeated me. It was not easy to learn. However, one day I got him. I got him, good and plenty. I threw him clear over my head on his belly, and I had it. I had it. Professor Yamashita later said that while Roosevelt was his best pupil, he was also, quote, very heavy and very impetuous, and it had cost the professor many bruisings, much worry, and infinite pains during Theodore's rushes to avoid blaming the President of the United States. Can you imagine that? Teaching martial arts to someone who is really gunning for you, and the thing that you really want to do is put them down, but you can't because they're the President. <laughs> I would not envy that position. The president became America's first judo brown belt. And if the research I've done is correct, the most senior rank of high-level politicians until Vladimir Putin. As an aside, Putin has an eighth don in Kyokushin Karate. I've long wondered why judo seemed to have a place in the United States before karate, before jujitsu, before taekwondo. I mean, taekwondo, you know, the we have a little bit more of an understanding because of when it was created, but really karate, right? And I think this answer is, at least for me, why? President Roosevelt sort of laid a foundation for martial arts in America, and as big of a personality as he was, even though TV wasn't really a facet and and American families didn't spend the time listening to the radio. There wasn't the volume of radio programming that we have of TV programming or podcasts or movies or anything. Today, I'm sure that it was written about frequently in the newspapers because this is kind of juicy stuff. It's a president acting sort of unpresidential. And people like that kind of gossip. So we can see the foundation that was laid for judo that led to karate, that led to taekwondo. You know, depending on how you want to look at it, we may not be the bastion of martial arts that we are if it hadn't been for President Roosevelt. So I find that kind of fascinating. Hopefully you enjoyed all of this. Now, did I miss a piece? Was there something else that you know from your research about Teddy Roosevelt that we should put in here? Or maybe there's another historical figure that has some martial arts stories that you'd like to see covered. Whatever it is, let us know. You can email info at whistlekick.com. You can leave comments on the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can get to us on Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Just search for Whistlekick. We'll come up in any of those locations. And so that's pretty much it for today. If you want to check out our products, whistlekick.com is where you can find those. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.